Welcome everyone to the Minds of Money Global Pitch Battle, the first virtual one of many. Uh, well, hopefully not too many. So for those of you who are new to the pitch battle, it's basically like Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, but for junior mining. Uh, so I'm going to assume that most of you have got the gist of this. So we have five investors and five presenting companies. Uh, each company will have a short three minutes to present, followed by seven minutes of Q&A by the investors. Uh, and then we have a wrap up at the end uh, where we will discuss the feedback from the investors and hopefully we'll pick a winner. So it's my responsibility that everything runs on time. Uh, so I will be giving prompts 30 seconds before your time is up. And uh, so therefore I stress to the Investor panelists, so you should keep your questions short and to the point. And presenters, if you are using slides, please remember that your time is limited. Uh, so just to run through who we have on the panel. So uh, me, my name is Tommy Horton. I am the co-chair of the London Mining Club. We have five presenting companies, which will run in the following order. We have Robert Stewart, who's a managing director of Geophysics Jamaica. We have Matthew Gill, who's managing director of White Rock Minerals and also a former pitch battle winner. Uh, Dan Thomas is the managing director of Hammer Metals. Chad Peters, who is the CEO of Ridgeline Minerals, and Fred Bell, who is the managing director of Elemental Royalties. And our sharks, or AKA judges, we have Emily Smith, uh, sorry, Smith, Emily King. Emily is the founding principal of KWR Capital. It's a new private equity fund looking at gold, silver, and copper investments. She's also the founder of prospectorportal.com, a new AI-enabled uh, search engine for the mining industry. Uh, she's uh, a geologist by training and also VP for Women in Mining USA. We have Car McCurdy. Car is a partner of Rock Elm Capital, an alternative investment firm focused on mining, oil and gas, and the agribusinesses. He's worked as a geologist, a banker, investor and a consultant for many stakeholders in the extractive industries uh, throughout his career. Mark Tyler. Mark is the London representative of Aramet International, a precious metals merchant from New York. In addition to its trading businesses, Aramet Resource Income Fund makes investments into producing and near production mining companies. Of Angelos, Angelos Damascos, he is the CEO of Sector investment managers and the founder and manager of the Junior Gold Fund, which specializes in investments in the smaller gold, silver and exploration, um, exploration and development companies, uh, a fund that he has managed for over a decade. And last but by no means least, Professor Torsten Denning. He is the CIO of uh, Asset Management Switzerland, a uh, mining investor of, of more than 15 years, and he's also a professor of economics and finance. So, with all the introductions complete, uh, I will now hand over to Robert of Geophysics Jamaica, uh, who will present. You have three minutes, Robert, so cameras off uh, to all the presenters, except uh, for Robert. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am just looking to share the screen and a couple of extra clicks. Can everybody see that? And the control has now disappeared for PowerPoint. There we go. All right, so three minutes, and I'll just go right into it. Um, Geophysics Jamaica is a privately owned and operated uh, company. It's entirely self-funded by me, which means we're really committed, or my joke for the day, we should be. No existing exploration industry in Jamaica. Uh, this has meant that we can't call people to do surveys or bring in helicopters or carry tools up the hill. So we've had to buy a lot of equipment, all of our geophysical tools, and as including two core drills. We brought in a lot of outside experts to train the local teams. Uh, we have 20 graduate geologists on our teams. We typically run nine or 10 teams per week. Um, it's the largest program in the history of the nation. Uh, the entire island is being covered from end to end, uh, holistically, 11,000 square kilometers, and we've done 25,000 assays to date. Um, In-house capabilities, we don't have time to discuss, but we can always come back to that. Uh, our, our exploration focused on three key areas. Um, the last 200 years, a lot of exploration has been done of various degrees of success on the exposed inlets, which are 30% of the island. 
The limestone covers 70% of the island. It's never been explored, and we made that a target as well. And as a bonus, we've also found some uh, heavy rare earths. Uh, this is an example of some of the stuff that we've found in the 30%. Uh, this, is a new, uh, this is a new project that was not previously documented. Uh, it is epithermal, uh, gold and silver. It's got some really nice Gingoro veins. Um, and uh, the grades are very good. We're getting over an ounce of gold per ton in the rocks. And uh, we are actually sending our drill up the hill next week uh, to begin setting up. And within two or three weeks, we'll be getting core from this area. Uh, another project is uh, Rise Up. Uh, there's a breccia pipe and some scarns and epithermal. Uh, so far, we're getting 20, up to 25 grams of gold in rock and uh, various degrees of gold in streams and soil. Um, this is filling out quickly, and we're enjoying it. Those are two of the examples from the, um, from the, from the uh, exposed areas. This is a, an area now under limestone. We've got six targets that we've identified under limestone. This is a 30-kilometer long trend. And we're filling out two hotspots currently. We have an RC rig drilling two, seconds, points, Bobby. two points on this this week, that to mark today, actually. And I'm going to hand over now for the rarest, Mike. Sorry, Mike. Right. Very quickly, Geophysics Jamaica has discovered a new ionic absorption rare earth deposit, the first of its kind, in the North American Caribbean region. The key point is that it is very similar, if not identical, to the South China rare earth deposits, which are the source the main source of heavy rare earths in the world. So um, in the question and answer period, I'd be very happy to expand upon our new discovery, which covers a number of square kilometers. Thank you. Great, let's go into the Q&A then. Um, so just make sure that the uh, investor panel have your cameras and you're off mute, please. Who would like to ask the first question? Sure, I would, um, um, I, I'm just curious, um, uh, how, um, what's your plans for allowing uh, new investors to participate? How do you uh, look to go about uh, bringing in new capital? So we weren't going to actually break cover for another two or three months because we wanted to get some assays on drill core. Uh, our plan was not just to jump in and say, hey, we've got some nice uh, prospects and we've got some licenses, can you source us? But the, what we wanted to do was actually get the drill in and get some proper core assays in some of the key projects and identify the best ones. Um, we, also, uh, we also really wanted to add some value to the projects before we went to the market. It's, it's all self-funded right now. And, um, and I'd say that with the core that we're currently getting and the core that we've taken so far from the Rise Up project, uh, we should have that data very shortly. Um, I think that our strength is that as a Jamaican company, we have a, a lot of influence here locally in Jamaica. Uh, we, we have other companies and we are good friends uh, and have very good relationships with, with a lot of the uh, agencies that we need to work with, including NEPA, the Environmental and Planning Agency, Water Resources, uh, and, and, and onwards. So we're looking to actually license uh, bulk sampling and some limited mining and have a package ready. Uh, just before we go on to the next question, Bobby, uh, you, you don't need to have the share screen anymore. Okay, let me end that. Cheers. Uh, except, um, may I ask Michael, um, do you intend to develop the, the Rare Earth Project as part of geophysics, or are you intending to spin it out already? Um, well, the Rare Earth Project is just one of the uh, projects in Bobby's portfolio in Jamaica. It's a, it's a new discovery, but it's quite unusual in that it's the first one in the Western Hemisphere, North America, the Caribbean region. Um, we're doing um, quite a bit of evaluation on it. We're doing some leach solution testing right now. Uh, it's a very important part to any rare earth project around the world, as you're aware. Most of the rare earth projects really are not viable. Uh, the metallurgy is too difficult. However, this particular type of deposit, the ion absorption rare earth type deposits, are leachable and they're low cost and they're rapid. So we're in that evaluation stage right now, in addition to defining the limits of this deposit, which we have not done yet. It covers a number of square kilometers. And the samples are actually in the lab right now being worked on. Bobby and Michael, on that, could you explain a little bit about how you're using new technology in your program and what kind of technology you're using? So, um, so Number one, because we were essentially had to build our whole program from scratch and there wasn't anybody locally that we could use. We've brought in 
uh, a number of sensors. We have magnetic sensors for both drone work as well as helicopter. We have a helicopter stinger. Uh, we've used everything uh, from GPR to help identify some of this, uh, these veins coming near surface uh, to uh, radar satellites. Uh, we do backscatter studies to look at soil conductivity. That's how we found one of the projects. Um, we also have radiometrics, uh, radio spec uh, sensors for both drone and helicopter. Um, and yeah, we, we have way too many toys. We have passive EM, we have both VLF and ELF as well. And we're going to be farming out. We're going to be bringing in mobile MT and AirTem uh, later this year. Maybe as a follow up on the, on the other question, can you explain a bit how to uh, um, allocate the, the funds, uh, the uh, monetary funds uh, between the traditional metal, uh, the, the, uh, the precious metals and the new project on the real, um, rare earth side? Uh, is it a 50-50? Is it like a small 10 to 90 percent uh, um, thing in terms of uh, allocation? Well, since, since I'm spending all my own money right now, I haven't pre-assigned any cuts or any, any shares. Uh, what we did is we've had a three-pronged program. We started off with stream sampling and then soil sampling across the island. As we identified good projects, we started to allocate some of the teams to go and work closer in on those and get more data while we continued filling out the island. So in the next two months, we'll have completed the last corner of the island. Uh, but at the same time, we've been working on the projects. Uh, I don't believe that somebody who is interested in a warrior earth project will necessarily be interested in one of our gold projects and vice versa. Uh, except in some cases where where it might be a byproduct of copper. But um, so we're, we're trying to create each set of projects uh, to suit the individual markets that, that, that might be interested in them. And there's, there's no set budget because we don't know who's going to take on what yet. Can I clarify uh, your business model? Uh, I'm trying to understand how you approach the business. It seems that you are offering both prospecting services as well as exploration of the license that you have already secured. So is that the case? Do you offer your, your technology services to third party companies or do you acquire the licenses first, then do your own prospecting evaluation and then seek to raise funds or divest uh, projects or, or maybe farm out projects as the case might be? So we started prospecting uh, first and as we found targets, we then started putting down licenses uh, we're, we're far ahead, the largest license holder now. We have over 40 uh, licenses across the island. Um, we're pretty busy on the, on, the actual, uh, on, on the actual services side because all of our equipment and people are going into our projects. Uh, however, uh, there's a project that came up for some seismic work uh, that we actually will take on because it's a revenue opportunity to help support what we're doing. Uh, and we will have spare teams available once we finish the canvassing of the island. So we're doing a limited amount of work uh, for third parties, uh, but right now most of the equipment and teams are busy working our licenses. Right. Yeah, we've got time for one quick question. Final quick question. I've got one, Tommy. Bobby, uh, we're supposed to be hypothetically asking questions to invest a million dollars in the company's pitching. So even though you're not looking for money in the real world, hypothetically, if we were to invest a million dollars today, what would you use it for and when could we expect to get it back? Drilling. Uh, right now, we're just beginning a drill campaign. It's probably one of the more expensive things that we're doing. And uh, we've done a lot of work geologically, uh, mapping as, as well as uh, geophysically. Uh, and, and as well, you know, we didn't mention we're using um, ACLAB's uh, SG8, which is a high hydrocarbon study, which has helped us define some of the areas. But uh, to get to even a limited resource, we have to do more drilling than probably we will have the resources for. Okay, I'm going to have to call it there. Thank you very much, Bobby. Right, we're now going to hand over to Matthew Gill of White Rock Minerals. So um, make sure your camera's on and you're off mute. And if you're sharing a screen, far away. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, hopefully uh, the judges can see the screen. Yep. Uh, I understand I have three minutes, so I'll be quick. Uh, that's a photo of our Alaskan asset, uh, imaginatively called Red Mountain for the thing on the right. And uh, one of the deposits is called Dry Creek, um, which is not surprising. Uh, and the other deposit is called WTF. Um, but probably because this is censored, I'm not going to explain the uh, meaning of that deposit. Um, if I had to recommend something uh, to the judges, it would be invest your $1 million in White Rock. 
Um, why do I say that? Why do you ask? Asset base. Jurisdiction diversification, I think, is a very important uh, part of an investment criteria. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to wake up and have something happen like people have had in Tanzania or, or Malia. Malia, I should say. So I think sovereign risk um, and jurisdiction diversification, diversification is important. We own both our projects. Uh, they're both in first world jurisdictions. Um, we've got 180 square kilometres of uh, gold and silver, uh, Jork Resource, Jork Reserve uh, in Australia. And we've also got just under 800 square kilometres of central Alaska uh, in the USA. Uh, it's polymetallic, uh, zinc, silver, lead. And we've also got a very large Cretaceous gold, gold anomaly. So again, in anticipation of a question, what's so good about that? So again, diversification uh, across commodities, so precious metals and not a bad base metal in zinc. Uh, um, I think most people would probably agree uh, gold and silver in this current market are, are the hot commodities. And so we're nicely placed. Our two assets, so Mount Carrington in northern New South Wales, uh, Jork resources of gold, 350,000 ounces, 23 million ounces of silver. So in value, 50-50 split. Our Red Mountain asset in Alaska, uh, just under 700,000 tonnes of zinc, or if, if you're North American, one and a half billion pounds, 53 million ounces of silver, 350,000 ounces of gold. So combined on a chalk basis, over 700,000 ounces of gold, 76 million ounces of silver. 30 seconds. The equivalent of 3 million ounces of gold. So looking ahead, news flow. We're currently drilling our large gold anomaly. We've got a high grade zinc silver chalk VMS open and a long strike. We're fully funded with 15 million in the bank. Mount Carrington feasibility study done, some significant cash flows come out of it. Approvals to come and corporately an OTC QX listing uh, around the corner. And time's up. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so if you'd like to unshare your screen and uh, judges uh, microphone and cameras on, please. Okay. Who'd like to ask the first question? Um, perhaps I could ask. Um, the, the Australian project, you uh, intend to keep that as well um, and, and continue working on it while you do exploration, ground uh, um, early stage exploration on the other asset in Alaska? So they're both at different stages. Good, store, good question. Uh, growing a business with one single asset can be a challenge. Uh, Mount Carrington is less than three years from generating $30 million free cash a year. Uh, White Rock's been listed for 10 years. It'd be nice to be cash flow generative and not have to keep tapping the equity markets. Uh, Matt. Sorry, go ahead, Susie. Uh, Matt, so my question is, has the, uh, have the changes in the market and in particular the interest in silver changed your plans at all for how you're going to develop your assets or your company strategy? Certainly silver has, has been the unloved uh, cousin of gold. Uh, we all know it's the devil's metal and it can go down as quickly as it goes up. For our New South Wales asset, it's certainly a great option. Um, we would start with the gold. All of those financial metrics are on the gold. The project is paid back on the gold. That silver is in separate deposits, would come on as and when we're ready uh, at the right time at the right silver price. So it's given us more encouragement than less. Uh, in this current market. My, my question is, uh, Matt, uh, how do you allocate uh, funding and time and resources between the two projects? Uh, obviously, it's very attractive to have the cash flow as quickly as possible, um, and the, the, the exploration is attractive longer term. So how do you split your time and resources between the two? Uh, I think uh, men are pretty good at uh, multitasking, uh, Angelos. Um, you know, we've got a really good in-country team in Alaska of, of consultants. So, you know, we don't try and pretend to run it from uh, Ballarat here in Victoria, Australia. Um, and, you know, I've been a managing director of other companies. You get good teams 
uh, you know, decentralised to where the projects are. You you can do that, and you can handle these two projects. I think quite quite easily in that that scenario. And how do you allocate the budget for funding of this project? So we set out to raise $2 million at PDAC in March. We ended up raising $15 million. So that, that leaves us well-funded for this year and next year in Alaska with money left over. Uh, and that gives us the option now to look at Mount Carrington uh, in New South Wales. Ideally, Mount Carrington would be a joint venture uh, proposition. So someone farming into that, uh, using their balance sheet to earn a share of the asset uh, and move that project forward uh, while we're exploring in Alaska would be an ideal scenario. Yeah, I'm being facetious, Matthew. Um, uh, you know, Alaska sounds like a good jurisdiction at the moment. Um, what happens if there's a, a regime change and the environmental regime changes in Alaska uh, in the next year? Um, so that's already happened. Obama was um, quite... Uh, the Obama regime introduced a lot of difficulties for a lot of um, companies getting approvals, uh, the EPA in particular. Um, I'm not going to get too political, but Trump basically unwound all of that and more. So um, th there is that federal going backwards and forwards. The beauty of our project is we're on state claim. So we're not on federal claim, unlike the Pebble project that most people probably heard of. So we're state claim, Alaska based um, out of Fairbanks so and, and Anchorage. So, you know, we think, and, and, and Alaska is in the top five of the Fraser Institute, um, I think there's far less jurisdictional risk uh, in Alaska, irrespective of whether Trump's in or out, than there are in probably almost any other jurisdiction in the world. Uh, Matt, maybe a quick question. Um, with a company for your side, I mean, like your, like your asset, um, I see three options when you're getting allocated uh, $1 million in the moment. First, you're drilling and your exploration goes ballistic, uh, dr uh, ramping it up uh, with your extra money. You go on a long vacation to spend like uh, the, the pandemic time. Offered, you're looking for a one million M and A to increase the size of a company. What would be your strategy? Vacation. A vacation? Did you say? <laughs> no, no. I don't. Well, we're we're stuck in Victoria, um, going through a second wave of this uh, pandemic. So um, mm -hmm. I can't even leave Victoria, let alone Australia. So no, I'm probably stuck at home uh, for a while longer, Torsten. Unfortunately doing my job. So, so uh, it's, uh, you will concentrate on the drilling side then? Oh, absolutely. Okay, we've got time for one quick question. Yeah, Matt, it seems, it seems like uh, Carrington is your quickest route to, uh, to generating some cash flow. Um, you know, what, um, what's, what's the timing there if you uh, focus on that project? Uh, you know, how much time and effort to expenditure to get this to uh, more uh, definitive uh, feasibility stage of uh, definition? Yeah, good question, Car. So it's on mining lease already. It's had past mining. So the two gold pits are pre-stripped. There's a tailings dam there. It's on um, uh, mining lease. So it's got approvals to go. Um, New South Wales approval process, 12 to 18 months, three to $5 million. Um, then, um, given it's had past mining, it's a 40 million capex, so it's a low entry cost into production, and that build is about 12 to 18 months. So, from here to first bullion, two to three years, $45 million Aussie. Great. Well, we'll end there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, judges, you can you can keep your cameras on. Just uh, make sure you're on mute for the presentations. Uh, thanks, thanks, Matt, for your for your presentation. Now, going to hand over to uh, thanks, Dan everyone. Thomas of uh, of Hammer Metals. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks to uh, to Minds of Money for the opportunity to present. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. So I've unashamedly stolen the five at five marketing oh, you're, concept. You're not quite, oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Thank you. So I've unashamedly stolen the uh, the Minds of Money five at five marketing concept. We've improved it slightly. We're talking about six in six, and that's drill testing six high quality drill targets in a six month time period. We're halfway through that time period now. 
We're an ASX listed gold and copper explorer, exploring two of the world's great mineral provinces. Our properties here are lightly explored. In Mount Isa, we built a 2,200 square kilometre portfolio there, focusing on large scale IOCG systems. We've already defined resources there of 400,000 tonnes of copper. Currently, we're exploring with our joint venture partner, Jogmec, who are expending the money uh, and earning an interest over about 15% of our land holding there. In Western Australia, we're in the heart of the Yandel Gold Province, 24 million ounces of gold produced historically. We're exploring right next to an old mine that produced 4 million ounces. Again, a lightly explored property. To go with some great projects, you need a good team. And I've got a team with me that have discovered multi-million ounce deposits before. Ziggy Lubinecki and Russell Davis with, with Gold Road when they were a junior explorer, discovering the Gruyere Gold Deposit, a six and a half million ounce deposit. They are not only providing technical advice to our team and our project, they're also key contributors to equity in the company. This year alone, they've contributed $750,000 in funding. I think there's no better story out there for investors and seeing directors backing their concepts and their plays. And I think, I think what we're doing here is, is pretty exciting. You can see here our property starts less than 100 metres away from the old Bronzewing gold mine. So an operation that operated from 1997 to 2012, producing 4 million ounces of gold. We sit 100 metres away from the property and the property has been lightly explored. It's had about two years of effective exploration over the period, tied up in a legal dispute for a number of years. We've done some exciting stuff there last year. We're drilling here again soon. So we're starting a program there in October. One of the particular projects that we've, um, we've been doing a lot of work on over the last 12 months, so we've only had the gold assets for 12 months, is at a project called North Aurelia. So we've worked here, we've been here three times now with Aircore program. Every time we've come back here with Aircore, we've found more gold. We've now managed to unearth a two kilometer trend of gold mineralization. Our average drilling depth at the moment is only 50 meters. Drilling into seconds. a weathered bedrock here in Western Australia, quite common, you'll see zones of depleted gold and weathering. So what we can see here is some of those uh, uh, section of the drilling that we've done here, we still haven't drilled into the fresh rock where you see good grades of gold in this region. And when you compare our drilling to date to the original discovery hole at the Bronzewing Gold Mine, again, drilling into a depleted gold zone, four metres at 1.8 grams per tonne from 48 metres, I think our drilling stacks up quite favourably. We'll be starting a reverse circulation program here at the end of the month and we'll be looking to do 2,000 metres of drilling and hopefully get onto a resource. I think a two kilometre trend of significant gold mineralisation is indicative of the potential of this region. Great, Dan, we'll so have to call it there. Sure. Well, that's, uh, that's your three minutes up, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, if you'd like to unshare your screen and uh, judges, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, please make sure you're off mute. Okay, may I jump in with the first one? Uh, as we all know, uh, Australia is hit uh, hardest uh, with Corona, not Corona, but Corona restrictions. So in terms of traveling, how is the impact for you uh, looking forward in the next months? Yeah, it's actually pretty good. So we've been exploring in Mount Isa for five to six years. So we've got a pretty established team in Queensland. So they're being left to their own devices. Our team, we're based in Perth. So for our West Australian project, um, we're local. We know the conditions here. We're able to explore freely. And we've really been un unimpacted during the, the six months, other than, I guess, some concerns around funding when, when coronavirus kicked off. But as we've seen with the gold price, um, we're in a pretty good position from a funding perspective. Dan, if we were to invest a million dollars today, how would you use it? And when do you think we could expect to see it back? Yeah, sure. So we've got a unique capital situation at the moment. We've got three million in cash. We also have 150 million options out there at the moment, or potentially, I guess, warrants from a North American perspective. They are exercisable by 30th of September this year. They're in the money at three cents and we're trading at four and a half. They're potentially bringing in another four and a half million dollars. Our programs are fully funded through until Q2 next year. So a million dollars coming into the company now would allow us to be more aggressive with our drilling program. And if we get any hint of uh, good results, particularly at the target I just talked about, it would enable us to start a resource drill out there and move, move, move the project forward. Uh, I'd imagine with any good news um, in terms of a return date, if you want to be on the ride for the, for the development story, and that's what we're all here for, um, we'd certainly welcome long-term investors in the company. If not, I think a re-rate's just around the corner, which um, provides a quick return if that's what you're looking for. 
Dan, can I ask, uh, in my experience, companies with uh, assets in, in diverse uh, metals, such as copper, base metal, and gold, can be a little bit confusing or distracting for those investors that are seeking pure exposure to the precious metals. Uh, is there an emphasis in your portfolio? Do you put like, priority in one project over the other, or how do you split your resources? Yeah, Angelus, good question. Um, I think from, from my perspective, I joined on the strength of our copper and gold assets, and I'm a copper guy, I get them. Um, for a junior explorer, though, with the gold markets where they are, I'm incredibly thankful that we have a gold asset in the portfolio. Our investors expect their funds to be currently diverted towards those gold projects, and that's where they're firmly focused at the moment. We have a really fortunate situation that our tenure in Queensland is supported by a joint venture partner who are funding our activities there. So whilst our, I guess, attention is split across two projects from an operation and exploration perspective, both programs are fully funded with our investor funds focused firmly in the gold, gold project. Right. Thank you. So Dan, can I ask the job make uh, earning? You say that's limited to 15%. Is that for the current program or is that 15% ultimately? Sorry. Thanks, Mark. I should clarify, it's 15% of our tenure. So over 2,200 square kilometres, they're earning a 60% interest in 300 square kilometres out of our portfolio. So 6 million expend over five years to earn 60% of 300 square kilometres of that portfolio. And just to follow up, Dan, um, what... What have they got to take it to at the end of that, that program? Is it a feasibility study or investment decision? Or? No, it's purely just a, a expenditure on exploration. So there's um, then a co-contribution from both parties. So we've re retained a meaningful interest. And importantly, in that transaction, we kept 100% interest in our Jork resources. And Dan, I mean, there are a lot of guys in WA exploring for gold. I mean, what would you say is, is the unique feature about yours, your prospects? Yeah, I think the fact that we're all of the three targets that we're drilling within 20 kilometres of a historic mining operation, all of the plant and equipment remains there. Um, there's been feasibility studies on that plant completed in the last two years. They estimate a restart of the mill there costing 50 million. Our neighbouring tenement holders are Northern Star. They've got 1.1 million ounces in resources nearby. They really, I think, are looking for another half a million to 1 million ounces in the region to restart that mill. And I see our company playing a key role in helping rejuvenate, I guess, the, the, the gold mining in that region. And if that fails, there are probably another two mills within sort of a 100 kilometre radius of where we're operating there. Okay, time for one quick final question. And is Ziggy working for you full time or is he just consulting? He's probably averaging two or three days a week. I try and get him out of the office as much as I can, but he's an active contributor. He's, um, he's very good value. So um, just, to, just to be clear, a million dollars today is, uh, is really going to go in the ground at, uh, at uh, Bronzewing, correct? Yeah, correct. So JogMecca funding the work. We've just drilled uh, three separate targets in Queensland. Results out over the next couple of weeks. Um, all of our funding is going to those three targets. We're drilling at Bronzewing over the coming three months. Okay, okay. Let's, uh, let's call it there. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a good presentation. We're um, now passing on to Chad Peters, who's the CEO of Ridgeline Minerals. Um, uh, Make sure your camera's on and you're off mute. You have All three right. minutes. Yep. Can you guys see me? Can everybody yeah. see my screen? All right, perfect. All right, so we're Ridgeline Minerals and we're gonna find Nevada's next gold discovery. Uh, we are listed on the TSX Venture under RDG. And I'm gonna tell you why I think we're a great investment. Here's our uh, disclaimer, just a quick look at that. All right, so why invest in Ridgeline Minerals? Um, I've spent the last two days pitching to all kinds of investors from all over the world here at Mines and & Money, and if any one of you were a victim of that, I sincerely apologize for having to go through this again. Um, but what I really want to focus on is, is that, you know, I may have talked about how we have three great projects in a world-class jurisdiction. I might have also touched on our management team and board who've been credited with multiple discoveries in Nevada over the last five, ten years. Um, and those are all very exciting parts of our company. 
But what I really need to focus on is our drill contract. It's what truly sets us apart from our peers. So I co-founded Ridgeline out of my garage in 2018 alongside the owner of um, a drilling company. Now, what that means for Ridgeline is that guarantees us guaranteed access to drill rigs at a significant discount to market rate for three years or 50,000 feet of drilling, whichever comes first. And in a world where you're only as good as your last drill hole, that gives us a huge competitive advantage to our peers. So it allows us to put more meters into the ground with every dollar than our peers in Nevada. And it uh, significantly increases our chance of making a discovery early in the expiration cycle. But it's not the only thing that sets us apart. We have a great share structure with over um, just under 48 million or just over 48 million shares fully outstanding or non-diluted. And we have 57 million shares fully diluted. We have a treasury that is just under $6 million Canadian after completing our recent IPO on August 12th. So we're have fully funded for 2020 and 2021 expiration. And we have a management team that's firmly aligned with the shareholders. We own 17% of the company. I'm the largest individual shareholder at just under 8%. And I went the first 14 months of the year without taking a salary. And I followed that up with putting 150,000 Canadian of my own money into the company. So I am firmly aligned with my shareholders. I am motivated to make this a success and I don't have any other side hustles. This is my only venture and I'm committed to making it, uh, making a go of it. So I'm gonna talk about our projects. We have three projects in the Carlin and Battle Mountain Eureka trends and they're a very diversified portfolio. So we have high grade underground potential at both Carlin, East and Swift. These are district scale projects, 39 kilometers and 40, 51 square kilometers in their own rights. And they're directly adjacent to some of the biggest gold mines in North America. Um, and then on top of that, we have the legal, our Selena project, which is directly um, on the South Carlin trend, shallow oxide open pit. We have multiple catalysts over the next three months of the, of the year. We're drilling 6,000 meters across all three projects with multiple catalysts every two to three weeks um, heading into November. So we are a discovery focused company. We're looking to add value per share for our, our shareholders and we're gonna do it with the drill bit. So um, this is a little taste of, of one of our projects, Carlin East. That's a view of the gold strike mine uh, two kilometers away. It's a 40 million ounce open pit owned by Barrick. So I feel like we're in a great spot. And if you're looking for exposure to gold, um, you should strongly suggest taking a look at Ridgeline. Great, Thank thanks, you. Chad. Um, the uh, investor panel, make sure your cameras and uh, are on and you're off mute. Um, who would like to ask the first question? I'll go first. Chad, uh, you said you're only as good as your last drill hole. So how was your last drill hole? Oh, you got me. Um, <laughs> our last drill hole at Selena um, was at our shallow oxide project. We hit nine meters of 0.57 gold and uh, nine, uh, 0.57 gold and seven grams silver. I believe that started about five meters below surface. So that's our shallow oxide target. We're working into that um, target now and we're testing down in the valley where we believe we'll hit a more, a larger and thicker intercept in the more preserved host rock. Okay, as an investor, we're not only looking for like a good company, look uh, on a good asset, we're also looking for a good management. Can you point out like one or two keys from your experience why you can personally make uh, your company success? Absolutely. So I've been a part, uh, I previously worked for Ridge, uh, Premier Gold Mines, you and Downey's company out of uh, Canada. I've been a part of over 12 million ounces of discovery with Premier Gold previously, including leading the team that discovered the CSD gap. In Nevada, which became a joint venture with Barrick in 2017. That was a high grade underground target. Um, my vice president of exploration was lead jolly behind three of the North Stars over five objects through resource gauge. And, um, uh, you know, if we make a discovery, we can take this thing to uh, its maximum valuation before monetizing the asset. Uh, just to check, did everyone get that? I, I had a little bit of disturbance on my end. Do, do we need to get oh, Chad to repeat that? We got you up to VP, I believe. Sorry, You're I, telling I, about I, your VP of expiration. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. My VP expiration, Mike Harp, was with Gold Standard Ventures. He discovered over 5 million ounces with his team there before coming to work with us. We've done multiple resources and PEA level studies as a comp uh, uh, between Mike and I. And we, uh, we're ready to take this, uh, if we make a discovery, to take it to a resource stage and, and monetize an asset um, at a ridge line. Uh, Chad, uh, yes, getting that. can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, and I have to put a disclaimer here, but I, I, I'm already a shareholder of a fund in Ridgeline, so I know the story. But uh, I think in your presentation, 
um, you, you haven't come across as to how much drilling you have done to date. Uh, obviously, you don't have a resource, but you have done a lot of drilling. Can you give us some highlights of your drilling activity? Sure. Uh, we drilled uh, over uh, about 1,100 meters at Carlin East last year. We proved our, our geologic model, which was that the host rocks at Carlin East were 700 meters deep instead of 2,000 meters deep, deep, like Newmont previously thought. That's how we were able to pick up the project. It's kind of a forgotten about asset. We've also done 1,200 meters of drilling at our Salina project. Um, as I mentioned, that last the highlight intercept there was nine meters of, of uh, 0.57 gold, and we've trenched up to 50 meters of 0.65 gold at surface across that same target. Um, so we're going to be drilling an additional six, uh, 5,000 meters this fall um, at all three projects with a pretty even split on meterage between all three. Chad, may I ask, um, your target identification is being driven by your geologic model, not by geophysics or um, soil yeah. sampling? We believe in systematic exploration. Um, so we've done, you know, as a private company, we spent four point, uh, about four million of the money that we raised as a private co doing the geochem, the geophysics, the field mapping, all of that baseline data that, that allows you to build a geologic model. And I think until you've done that baseline work, you really can't put a hole down because you're just taking pot shots at that point, right? So we layer the data, we build a model, we test that model, and then we revise. And that's how we work across all of our projects. Another question, Chad, you mentioned uh, you'd build to the resource stage and then monetize. What do you see as a potential exit plan or, or how would you monetize the asset at that time? Sure. Um, you know, I think exploration is, is inherently risky and you can have a couple great holes and you still can see, uh, you know, a project not pan out, you know, the way you'd expect it to. So we're always looking to balance risk as a company and depending on the project, um, we would look at different approaches. So Carlin East is the largest in, we're the largest landholders outside of Nevada gold mines in the North Carlin trend, right? 39 square kilometers. They are a logical joint venture partner. If we were to have any success at Carlin East, they have a mill two kilometers away. That's how you're going to get the maximum value out of that thing and reduce risk to us. I'd prefer to see a carried interest. Now, if we made a discovery at Salina, that's a shallow oxide opportunity. Anybody can come in and buy that office. So I would take that to a resource stage, show the blue sky potential that we can get that thing up, you know, double the resource size of it for a new, a new buyer. And I'd like to, to more look into just an outright sale. So it depends on the project. I prefer to just sell projects. I don't like JVs, but if the right opportunity comes up, we'd absolutely do it. Uh, Chad, you've, you've, you mentioned you've invested some $4 million to date as, um, as, a, um, as a private company. Uh, some of that appears to have come uh, through uh, uh, royalties. What what sort of royalty burden um, exists um, on uh, on your current holdings? You bet. So we actually spun our core projects out of EMX Royalty Corporation. So all three projects, we've since doubled the land packages, but the original deal was they took 9.9% .9 of Ridgeline's equity, which at a pre-money valuation of 750K seemed like a heck of a deal at the time um, in 2019. Um, they took a 3.25% royalty on all three projects with a buy down to 2.25 with my main goal was that net royalty had to be below 3%. Um, so we have no work commitments on any of the projects. We have very low AMRs, we're talking five to 10,000 a year. So our money's going in the ground and it's going into the projects and the targets that it should be not into a block of ground that needs to have a, a work commitment satisfied. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great deal. It, it focuses the money in the ground early. What about a minute left for any final questions? I'll there ask one more. One. Chad, uh, how about the, the technology aspect? Are you using anything new and innovative with all the data you've gathered? Yeah, so it's it's kind of funny actually. We we say uh, exploration done differently, but you know, that's our, our kind of tagline. But we actually it's kind of the same as as a lot of folks 20, 30 years ago were doing it when they were making a ton of discoveries. So we actually focus on doing all of that baseline work, which it hasn't changed, right? You map, you do the geochem, you do the geophysics. But what we're doing differently on top of that is we're then taking in that data. We're using iogas. We're using um, we're using XRF uh, machines in the field to try to you know advance our understanding while we're mapping. Um, we're taking our leapfrog models and we're incorporating in um, geophysics inversion, 3D inversion. We're trying to tr we're trying to do whatever we can to minimize at risk by by fully understanding what our target may look like before we put a hole on it. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, Chad. That was really good. Uh, on to now Frederick Bell. He's the managing director of Elemental Royalties. 
Uh, don't forget to turn the camera on and turn yourself off mute. You've got uh, three minutes. Hi, Tommy. Thank you. I will share my screen as well here. Just a few slides to take you through um, as we have three minutes to go. So quick overview for those who aren't familiar with Elemental. It's, um, it was a private royalty company for the last three years. We just listed at the end of July on the TSX fee. We have um, six royalties as a portfolio. And I think the key factors for us, we've only got three minutes here, are uh, we offer diversified royalty revenue from the outset. Um, we have six royalties, five over operating assets. We have 98% of our net asset value on royalties over operating mines. It's weighted towards precious metals, so 90% on that side. We are key, diversified, not just by revenue, but by, by operator, six different companies. We're diversified by jurisdiction, um, five different countries. And that gives us really good free exposure to additional resource growth across those assets. And you know, as an example, um, I think uh, at Mercedes, one of our royalties, it's, it's had a 98% resource to reserve conversion since the mine was built in 2015 at Wang Yon, um, the other district scale royalty that we have, it's a thousand square kilometer license package um, with a, it was a starting 13 year reserve life that just came on. And um, they've actually recently increased production from 135,000 ounces up to 150,000 ounces after two quarters of production. And um, I announced an uh, exploration program to increase in my life. So what you're getting is really good exposure to a fast growing royalty company, which has a lot of downside protection. And when I talk about you know, the growth of the company, we have um, more than doubled our revenue on average since we started as a private company. And so we forecast revenue for this year of over 5 million gross US revenue. Um, we've been a private company to date. So we've had a lot of constraints on us in terms of capital, in terms of our valuation, that I think the listing really unlocks going forwards. And um, the Mercedes royalty starts paying us from a fixed date in July, 2022. And so you can see that coming on there. So next slide, quick overview of the capital structure. We have about uh, an 80 million Canadian uh, market capitalization at the moment. We have about 13 and a half million in cash. We have no debt and um, we are cash flow positive and, and we have been since we started the company. Management owns banks about 24% of the company. Institutional investors, just over a third. And the only options performance rights are held by management and employees. No warrants or third party instruments. In terms of a quick summary then, you're coming in at the ground floor level to a royalty company that has a track record of finding, executing, good value deals. Every fundraiser we've done since we started has been at a higher price than the last. Um, we have got really good quality assets on you know, producing assets that's enabled um, us to limit dilution. And I think we've never been in a better position than we are to date um, following listing with the management team, more access to capital, ability to use our equity for the first time. And we also joined Discovery Group, which is a uh, alliance of Canadian companies. Um, so I think it puts us in a really good position. That's a quick summary. Great, thank you ever so much, Fred. Uh, so thank you for unsharing your screen. Who would like to ask the first question? Yeah, uh, uh, Frederick, um, just curious, um, we've got a lot of eggs in, in a basket in uh, Burkina uh, Faso. What's, uh, what's going on, on on the ground there and how's that uh, impacting uh, um, you know, your, uh, uh, your interest there? So the, the royalty that we have in Burkina, Wang Yon, is um, right in the southwest of the country, um, on the border there. So the, most of, the, um, most of the, the trouble in Burkina that they've had has come along the borders with Mali and Niger. Um, and so actually the southwest has been pretty good. Um, notwithstanding that, two recent, um, I suppose, you know, actions that operator Taranga have taken. So they, um, they've, they've beefed up security quite a lot um, and they've, they've reported that publicly. Um, and then secondly, you know, related to COVID, I think there are a number of the mining companies in Burkina Faso are um, joining up their gold shipments out of the country um, due to travel restrictions. So I think that um, in terms of where the asset is, that probably gives us the most comfort. Um, and I would also say that on a you know, looking forward basis, 
I think that as we do more deals, probably our exposure is going to diversify further across different jurisdictions. So Tur Turing is accumulating bullion in country. You know, what, what, what sort of sales rights do they have? Do, uh, do they uh, export um, uh, the bullion and they, ha they have the ability to uh, maintain those proceeds in offshore accounts? Um, how does that work exactly? So, so um, on a royalty basis, just for us as firstly, um, generally most of our royalties are gross revenue and net sales royalties. So they come off the top line. Typically in most of the jurisdictions we have royalties, the government, um, there is a withholding tax that's paid to the government. Typically that's a responsibility of the operator. So in this case, it would be Taranga as an example who would make the withholding payments on our behalf. And then we are paid by the operator directly. Uh, you referenced how diversified you are by commodity and geography with a million dollar investment. What would your strategy be with that million? Would it be to further diversify or double down? How would you use it? I, what we've said is, is we'd, we'd keep her waiting towards precious metals. And I think that's a, it's probably an aspect that's, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not exclusive to the royalty space, but there is a difference in valuation between precious metals royalty companies and non-precious metals royalty companies. And, and what we said when we listed the company is we are conscious of that difference in valuation and we'll act accordingly. And our first royalty was on Quale, a mineral sands tier one asset in the mineral sands industry. Um, and you know we had a under two and a half year payback on that. And so you can get some very good deals outside the precious metal space. But for us, uh, the focus in the immediate term is, is on precious metals. And I think as we go forwards and as we grow, you know, there is an ability to have an 80-20 ballpark rule of 80% precious metals. And where we see really good value opportunistic acquisitions outside that, we can do it. But I think in the short term, you know, we're only being listed a month now. I think really important to stick to what we said and keep the focus on precious metals. So then maybe if you could explain a little your process of, of how you evaluate uh, your projects or your investments then That's as you move forward. Yeah, that's a really good question because pretty much all of our acquisitions to date have come from third parties. So there have been third party royalties. And so we haven't always had the ability to get inside the data room of the operating company. Um, I think a few things we've done to ameliorate that along the way. Our first royalty, we actually syndicated with Pacific Road Capital, the Aussie PE fund. And they were the major and still are the major shareholders in base, the operator of that. And so that enabled us to get a lot more comfort on the asset than we might have otherwise been able to do. When we bought the second royalty in Australia, um, the operator there is Zijin. So it's a, it's a well-known mine, um, but we didn't, they don't provide the same transparency as a, a TSX or an ASX company would do typically. And um, in that case, you know, we had a connection through some of our Aussie shareholders and management um, to, to some, of the, some of the people there. And we were able to get a, a much better insight than would have been the case otherwise into what was actually happening on the ground, what their plans were. Um, and I think that in terms of due diligence going forwards, you know, we have a very, um, we, we have a very heavy bias towards publicly listed mid tier and above companies where there is a good amount of visibility on operations. And if you look at the types of royalties we've done, we've mostly done royalties on existing operating assets where there is a demonstrable track record of production and where we see the downside risk as, as a lot less. Frederick, uh, can I ask, uh, in my experience, the, the royalty model is more attractive in a better market when the availability of funding is scarce for mining companies. Uh, in a bull market such as the one we are today, when the equity markets are open and provide uh, ample liquidity to companies, how do you see your competitiveness in attracting royalties and, and therefore the deal flow for your company? Two different aspects to this. Um, the third party royalties and the royalties that we would write with operators in newly. And I think you're definitely right that for an operator, you're typically looking at a royalty as an alternative to equity or to debt. And so in these market conditions, and I think we, we do see it, you know, there is an ability for operators to raise equity relatively easily. And, and so a royalty is less attractive. Conversely, and again, all the royalties we've done today have been third party. Um, I think actually, it's, uh, it's probably a trigger for some of the third party royalty owners, the current market to look at selling their royalties. And if not selling the whole thing, divesting half of it 
um, for example, into equity, into us, and then keeping some exposure. So I think it's very divergent answers based on whether you're writing a new royalty with an operator, where it is more difficult, or whether you're looking at pre-existing royalties, where actually they might look at the current market and go, okay, now is a good time if I was thinking about it to sell part of that royalty. Mm -hmm. I would like to twist uh, the same question a bit in the other direction uh, from in, to put yourself into the, inv uh, the investor side, uh, investor shoes. You look at the royalty company, okay, this is like uh, for not as risky as an exploration company. But when you look into your portfolio, you have like quite exotic uh, jurisdictions. So how would you uh, counter that argument? Because uh, when investors are probably looking for, for investment in your company, they look for a little bit more conservative approach than into a single asset into exploration side. And then they see like, how would you balance maybe out the risks of, uh, of this uh, a little bit exotic jurisdictions you see in the portfolio? Okay, got 30 seconds on that, Fred. <laughs> okay, so just quickly, um, two royalties in West Australia, one in Burkina Faso, one in Chile, one in Mexico, and one in Kenya on base. And I think that, um, look, it gives us a pretty good spread across, across different jurisdictions. As a royalty company, naturally, you know, as we add more royalties to the portfolio, we are going to get more diversified. Typically, again, having been focused on third-party royalties, there are more opportunities in areas with historic mining industries. And so I think there's a bias towards areas where there has been more production. And um, I think certainly in North America, um, you know, there are a number of opportunities there. So I expect that um, just because of, you know, the business model and the way we've done it so far, we will probably lean more towards going forwards, more established mining jurisdictions, which hopefully answers some of those questions. Mm -hmm. Super. Thanks so much, Fred. And uh, thank you to all our presenting companies. Uh, we now hand over to the investors. Uh, what I want to hear is which company you'd place your hypothetical $1 million. And I'd also like some feedback on, on the other companies, why you decided to not go for them. So, Torsten, as you're on my screen, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from you first. <laughs> okay. Uh, a pleasure. Uh, pleasure, Tommy. Um, it, for me, it was a bit uh, close, uh, close race on that. Um, looking at the companies, I have a, a, a favorite and a close one favorite. Maybe to start uh, where I wouldn't allocate money in the moment. Uh, I wouldn't put, uh, uh, sorry for that, uh, in the moment some uh, money to Jamaica. Uh, but with uh, the rare earth stories, I'm uh, just not looking at rare earth projects in the moment. So if this is part of allocation um, uh, at a certain value and allocation, uh, I, I just put, uh, put it on a list. Um, royalties, uh, as uh, welcome to the club of a big uh, uh, royalty companies. Um, it's not my focus at the moment. It is, uh, I think, from my portfolio, you saw in my question that uh, I think the portfolio um, looking for a conservative gold um, allocation is maybe a bit too risky for my tastes. Uh, then I would like to increase risk. I'd like to increase in the project risk, not on, uh, on the diversified portfolio of um, these, these uh, jurisdictions I wouldn't set in the moment a foot on, onto it. Um, therefore, um, may, maybe um, to seek Australia, I'm careful in also Australia uh, as a whole in terms of, um, of uh, uh, current corona situation. So my both favorites are the white gold and the rich line minerals in terms of their portfolios. Um, I was voting for white gold, uh, white rock before. Uh, I like the company, uh, but this time uh, I need to say uh, you made it for me uh, as number number two, but no no harm taken. I hope uh, I liked um, uh, what I my reasons why I prefer rich line uh, minerals from representation set is um, not only the combination of of asset, uh, the proven jurisdiction that uh, you have at White Gold as well. Um, you have a Nevada, you have uh, the favorite metal, what I'm looking for in the moment in, uh, as an investor uh, on the gold, uh, gold side. Uh, I like what you pointed out, Chad, on the um, competitive advantage. Yeah, to have uh, like here the foot and to have like uh, the competitive function industry and the background, not only from the company, but also from uh, uh, your personal stance, from the management side, the experience, and to have the passion and a little bit of aggression to move forward and to make money and I would like to invest to make money myself. So therefore, I would place some money with you, Chad. Fantastic. Thanks, Torsten. Very thorough feedback. Angelos, would you like to go next? 
Thank you. Uh, likewise, uh, I'm a pure precious metals focused investor, so I, I like to have a very clear allocation and very clear direction in that uh, meta, in, in that uh, uh, sort of uh, discipline. Um, so, with regard to uh, the geophysics Jamaica, I think the model is a little bit confusing to me between the third party service of technology and the exploration. And in any case, I, I think it's a little bit also too early stage for us uh, with uh, very little proof of concept uh, in the actual license areas. Um, the royalty model uh, is also not appealing to us. As I said uh, earlier, royalties are attractive as a safe, uh, safer investment in a bear market, but not as attractive in a bull market because we all want to have uh, the so-called operational leverage to the metal prices. So I, I wouldn't go for elemental royalties either. Uh, so then the, the, the decision is between the three others, which are all uh, strong presentations. Uh, again, I think uh, the, the the hammer uh, company's presentation, the, the, the difficulty for me is how to evaluate the split between the copper and gold uh, weightings in value. So we we'll would probably put this as uh, in the second tier. So really the race is between White Rock and, and Ridgeline as far as I'm concerned. And I, I said earlier that I'm already an investor in Ridgeline, so I know the story far better. Uh, and, uh, and my preference is to double up, if you like, to invest again in Ridgeline and be my first contender. But uh, I, I quite like uh, the white rock positioning and the fact that they have more uh, proven resource in their model and therefore more substantive value that the investor could evaluate and assess the economic viability. Uh, but in this market, I think Ridgeline may, uh, takes my word. Fantastic. Thanks for that thorough feedback, Angelos. Uh, Emily, would you like to go next? Yeah, first off, thank you, everybody, for your pitches. I thought it was a challenging uh, battle to judge because uh, many of the companies were so different, right? So uh, difficult to compare apples to apples in a way. Um, I'm usually a, a big fan of early stage projects, and I, I love the work that Geophysics is doing in Jamaica because of that. I think a million dollars can make you a whole lot more money um, coming in at that stage. So they're actually at the top of my list for that reason. Um, but uh, I also really liked Ridgeline and, and White Rock um, because I like the, the share structure, and I like how both companies have very clear strategies for how they're going to uh, move forward. Um, I would say that the, the royalty company, I'm just not 100% familiar with the model. So that's why I would not put that on my list right now. Um, and Hammer Metals, I thought you guys did a great job. But similarly, maybe the, the strategy wasn't as clear to me. So uh, I would actually put it as um, Ridgeline at number one, White Rock Minerals number two, and Geophysics at number three. Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Carl, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. And uh, I'd like to echo uh, Emily's comments. You know, thank you, everyone. You know, great, great presentations under the gun, short amount of time uh, available. I, um, you know, there, um, there's a lot of things here to like, I think, um, you know, with all the, with all the presenters. Uh, I like the first mover sort of advantage uh, that um, geophysics has in, in Jamaica, it's a little uh, early stage uh, 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 for me, but um, but it seems like um, with a million dollars, you can have uh, an impact there and, uh, and a seat at the table at the end of the day to uh, really understand what's going on. Plus, I uh, spent uh, a lot of my uh, time earlier in my uh, uh, career, um, you know, in uh, in the Caribbean and um, familiar with its potential. And, uh, and I think it's great, uh, you know, the work uh, that's being undertaken there. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's a bit uh, early uh, stage for me. I think, um, um, you know, relative to my, uh, you know, current situation, I, I liked uh, Elemental. I believe that's uh, where I would uh, place my money at, um, you know, your, um, uh, your uh, producing um, uh, current returns. Um, you know, as we speak, I think that's great. Uh, you're you're off to uh, a good start. I think uh, you're going to have uh, a lot to learn as uh, 
uh, you know, with uh, with respect to uh, the royalty business and the underlying, uh, you know, details, the structure of the royalties, where you want to be when you uh, find yourself in a position better capitalized, uh, uh, you know, to um, to write your own uh, or uh, to uh, negotiate your own. And, uh, you know, I think I would um, uh, like to assist in that. So that's um, that's where my million dollars uh, would go. I uh, very much liked, um, you know, Ridgeline's uh, 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 approach and, and model. Uh, a bit too early stage for me, but uh, I think, uh, I think uh, you okay. know, Chad is very well uh, positioned uh, for success. Okay, Carl, I'm going to have to, sorry, Carl, I'm going to have to just interrupt you there, but uh, we've, got, we've got your winning, winning vote there, and I just need uh, a final minute and a half from Mark just to give us his, uh, his feedback before uh, we wrap this up. So, Mark, over to you. Good, Tommy. Thanks very much, and thanks very much to everybody who made the presentation. I think they were very good, all of them, um, and quite inspiring. Um, my, you, so you can start tabulating the votes. Uh, my first preference would be for White Rock, um, and, the, and the reason for that really is that I like the fact that there's exploration um, and upside associated with it, but there's also hedging the downside of the market. If the, things were to change, at least... Um, there's a possibility of getting into production by the time things change in the market and there would be cash flow that would then be able to support the company um, when the markets are not as attractive as, as they are today. Um, I think the other, the other um, the elemental story is a good one. Um, I think the way we'd like to invest in elemental is to sell some of Oramex royalties to, to elemental. I think they sound like a good, good bunch of guys who'd like to do that. And the other thing that was very interesting to me was the iron exchange um, deposit in Jamaica. I think um, that, that's that's a very unique thing, and, and it's quite interesting. But but I would still prefer to go with White Rock. Great. Well, thanks ever so much, Mark. Uh, we're going to wrap it up there, and uh, thank you to all the investor panelists. Uh, I think uh, White Rock got a good shout out. It was a previous winner, but uh, uh, not uh, not a winner again this this time around. Unfortunately, it, it looks as though the uh, the winner goes to, to Ridgeline. And uh, thanks to the presenters, to the, to the investors. Um, I believe in six hours' time, the next presentation is with Ira Thomas of Lucara Diamonds. She's being interviewed by uh, Sari Ganik of, uh, she's principal and founder of Bridge and vice chair of uh, Women in Mining Canada. And the next pitch battle is on Thursday. So uh, thank you once again for more information. Look at the Minds and Money uh, online. Um, agenda uh, but for now this is it so thank you very much hi everyone thank you <laughs>